Lost in a lot of the political debate about health care has been the remarkable strides made in medicine, the interventions that keep people alive, and the choices those technologies present to both patients and doctors. Today's guest documents those choices and their consequences in a beautiful new book. She's Dr. Daniela Lamas, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Selva Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Each week, we try to make sense of the stories shaping public life in the United States. We do that by talking to storytellers of every variety in any media, from film to books. Joining us this week is Dr. Daniela Lamas, a pulmonary and critical care physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, who's also the author of a new book, You Can Stop Humming Now, A Doctor's Stories of Life, Death, and In Between. Daniela, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. So uh, tell us a little bit about the book. Why did you write it? Well, I've long been fascinated by people's stories. And the first form that took was my working as a reporter, which I did in college and then a bit after college. And then I wanted to go to medical school. And so I ultimately went to medical school and had been thinking for years of a way to merge those two desires. I mean, being a doctor is about recognizing and telling people's stories. And it was really in this book that I was able to explore the before and the after of the patients that I took care of and I hope tell the stories that people haven't seen. And these are stories about really sort of what modern medical intervention means for human life. People who are either grievously ill or grievously injured and the, the interventions that we can do today and what their life is like during and after that intervention. Is that, is that accurate? Precisely, and I think that these are stories that people don't really see, and so it was my goal to shine a light on them. What are the, some of the big takeaways for you from it? So for me, a lot of the patients that I wrote about, some were people I had taken care of, some were people I found and interviewed more as a reporter, and often they surprised me. You know, I had come into some of these encounters thinking that people would be devastated by what had happened to them or be unable to adapt, and that wasn't always true. And so I, I think what I really learned and will try to apply to my work as a, as a doctor is that the way people adapt to these circumstances is different from person to person and we don't know what kinds of things people are willing to tolerate and what gives their life meaning until we ask so there there's are people deal with these states in very different ways that's interesting so some of some of the people you write about mm -hmm. patients uh, will return eventually to health and, and some will not and some sort of linger mm -hmm. in between as the subtitle of the book mm -hmm. says what is it like psychologically for people in that state and also for their families and loved ones who are not living it directly but are living it intimately as well? Yeah. I think that the in-between is, is the worst state and uncertainty for many people is the hardest, uh, the hardest thing to tolerate. Um, I'm thinking of one man who I wrote about who had the potential to get a heart transplant but the reality was that he ultimately didn't get a transplant and lived with a battery-operated partial heart assist device. And I had thought that living with this device without a transplant would be worse for him than the hope of a transplant. But what he ultimately told me was that uncertainty, that not knowing how things would be and thus not being able to own his reality and find ways to make his quality of life the best that he could, that that, that was the worst part. So I think that uncertainty is, is extremely hard. So, so that man is Van Chauvin, is, yes, do I have that correct? Yes, One of my favorite characters in the book, mm -hmm. uh, and there were a lot that I really liked. Tell me about him. He mm -hmm. liked to fish, mm -hmm. and having this thing implanted in him, the doctor said, don't ever go near water, mm -hmm. it'll short circuit, or whatever, you'll die, and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this guy, how you met him and what he was like. So Van was a fantastic guy. 
he he died um, since the book was uh, since I since I wrote his chapter before the book was published. Um, but I met him one day in uh, pulmonary uh, in uh, in his uh, heart uh, failure clinic. Um, so clinic for patients with VADs, so a ventricular assist device, this partial heart assist device. And I was interested in what it's like to live with that device. So I was just hanging around clinic. And he was a chatty guy. He was wearing his sort of camouflage uh, cap and a vest and uh, just wanted to tell me all about his life and ultimately invited me to his home. And what I learned about him was that for Van, he was able to tolerate living with this device, which meant that he carried a battery pack with him during the day. He plugged himself into a wall socket at night so that he didn't die. He was willing to live that way as long as he could do the things that gave his life meaning and pleasure. And one of those was fishing and teaching his grandson how to fish. And so for him and for his doctors, they had to recognize that, that for Van, a life of quality meant breaking the rules, that being fully safe and living within the constraints of his VAD assisted reality, that wasn't life for him. But by bending the rules a little, by going out on the lake, even though there was a danger associated with that, he could live and he could both extend his life, but even more importantly, prioritize his quality of life. And I think as a doctor, that's hard um, to, to, to recognize and to assist your patients in doing that. But that's something that I take away from but, Van's story. So, but his story is inspirational. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it sort of transcends his own particular situation. You talk at the end of the book about uh, learning of his passing, mm -hmm. and you have an image of him out on the water. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that image. So the last time I talked to Van before his uh, sister emailed me to let me know that he had died, he had asked me to come out on the lake if I was interested uh, in the boat that he had rehabbed. And he would show me around. He would take me fishing. He asked if I had gone fishing in a lake in Massachusetts, and I said no. He also asked if I had gone to a monster truck uh, event ever, and I said no. And I think he was, he was very disappointed by uh, the way that I you played it safe down, in, my own, in my own life. Um, but uh, I, I thought that maybe maybe one time in the next summer um, I would go fishing with Van, and it didn't, it didn't happen. Um, and so I've never seen him out there on the lake, but... When I met him in the clinic and I told him I wanted to learn more about him, he told me quite clearly that the hospital, the clinic, was not the place to do that, that where he lived was in his house and outdoors. And so that's the way that I will choose to see him, is on the lake doing something that he loved, even with his batteries in tow. What a beautiful image. It seems like there's a, I mean, the, the, you're really exploring what it means to be human in this book. Was that a conscious decision or did that come from, from the writing? I think the latter. Um, you know, I, I went, I sort of began the process of writing this book knowing that there were stories that I felt were important, stories that interested me, that I felt weren't in the public space and I wanted to tell them. But what lesson I could draw from those stories, if any, was entirely opaque to me. Uh, were, were you mindful of an audience when you were writing? I thought of my audience broadly. Uh, my audience, when I was actually writing the book, uh, was sort of family members, friends. Um, but I hoped that I hoped that the book would be able to have broader appeal because, to me, I mean, I'm a relatively young, uh, healthy person, and to me, these stories are meaningful. So I hoped that it was going to be meaningful more broadly. Talk about another person in the book, Sam Newman. Sure. He inspired the title, which, by the way, is you can stop humming now. It's just poetic and it just it conjures up a, a, a sort of a peaceful image tell us about sam he was another person in in who was young and good health until mm -hmm. yes so sam was a patient that i took care of when i was an intern in the cardiac intensive care unit one winter many years back now in new york city and he was a young man who had been healthy until he developed heart failure it turns out he had a rare autoimmune disease that attacked his heart. And by the time I met him, his options really for extending his life were few and were mostly the hope of a heart transplant. And what I wrote about in the book and the reason his story stayed with me is initially he, he terrified me. He was young, I had not taken care of somebody young before. But one day I was called into his room to do a small procedure. So to pull a central line out of his neck. And in that setting, you ask a patient to hum. 
I asked him to hum. The reason for that is to increase the pressure in the chest so that an air bubble doesn't go in where it's not supposed to. And as I pulled out the line and held pressure, we got to talking. And he ultimately asked if he could friend me on Facebook. And I said yes, and he did, and I accepted the request. The story goes on. Go ahead. Ultimately, I accepted the request. I looked at his photos. We didn't meet in real life again. A couple months passed, and then I got a message from him, and it said, can I stop humming? And I didn't reply. I'm not certain why. As I write in the book, I think maybe I was afraid that I had crossed some line, that I had come too close. But I, I, let, the, I, let, I let it be silent. And ultimately, I checked in on his page some months later and found that he had died. I learned it from messages of condolence on his, on his Facebook page. And I never got the chance to reply. And I think in some ways this book and the title really is a way to try to close the loop with people who I see in this moment of climax only so briefly. And I never know what happened. I never had the opportunity to follow up. And here I was trying to do that. Do you, uh, so I know that uh, prior to becoming a doctor, you worked as a, as a journalist with the Miami Herald? Yes. So uh, these, these two worlds, um, could you have written this book if you hadn't been a journalist? And could you have written this book if you weren't a doctor? If, mm -hmm. Aside from the access to patients that right. being a doctor gives you, right. uh, if you hadn't had those two experiences, could you have written a book like this? I think that those two experiences came together to allow me to write the book, you know, while, while I can't know. Um, I, I don't think that the questions that interested me would have interested me if I weren't a doctor. I think these questions of seeing people in these moments and wondering what comes after and having an understanding of what they've gone through I think was really important for me to connect with the patients and their families. And I think that the prior, the prior experience of, of being a reporter, of Kind of understanding the process of asking questions did help as well. So, so you lived you lived the story of <clears throat> these people from from the medical side mm -hmm. from your profession, mm -hmm. but then you have to go somewhere, your study, mm -hmm. wherever you write, and write about them, mm -hmm. and that's a very different mm -hmm. experience. Talk about that difference. Was it more emotional in doing the actual writing? You know, when you're when you're the physician taking care of a patient, that patient's well-being is first and foremost. Yes. You don't have that responsibility in front of your screen or however yeah. you write. Was it different for you emotionally? Yeah, I think it was. I think it's a great question. It was. It was different in in a few ways. I think one was exactly as you point out, uh, where my primary uh, goal and allegiance is. And and when you're a doctor, your your goal is to make a person better. And and when I was a writer, I, you know, I, I got to choose which details to relay. And, and I wanted to tell a good story, but I also wanted to tell a story that my patients, these people who had trusted me with their story, would be happy about. And uh, that, that was something that I felt like I had to navigate, um, is really trying to tell a good story and hoping that whether or not they were happy with it, they felt the story had done them justice. Um, and so I think that all of those kind of roles uh, were harder and, and less clear and crisp than the role of a doctor. The, the language is elegant and eloquent as well. Um, how many drafts do you go through? Talk about, we like to talk about craft. Mm -hmm. I at least am obsessed with craft. <laughs> so is Jim to an extent. Talk about that. How many drafts do you go through? When do you write? I mean, this book. Yeah. I wrote it in spurts. Um, I had some periods when I was being a doctor more in the hospital and wouldn't write during those periods. But when I had stretches of freer time doing research, I would write. I took one week in a library and with undergrads during their finals period, which was not deliberate, uh, and, and wrote a lot, uh, sort of inspired by their stress. Um, I went through, I would say, three to four uh, meaningful drafts. Um, one one big difference between the drafts and the final product is that initially I would delve into the history of some of these machines I was fascinated by and you know so proud that I knew these facts and had written them down but but ultimately they, they mattered a lot less to people than I thought and so a lot of that uh, went by the wayside in the final draft. There's an old saying in writing kill your darlings and I yes. think that's an example where you killed your darlings. Yes. Let's talk about some of the other people in the book too so uh, Andrea DeMeo Clancy and mm -hmm. her son Ben. Mm -hmm. Tell us about their story. 
They were, were wonderful people who also very generously invited me into their lives. And Andrea is Ben's mom. And Ben is in his early 20s. He was a college student, got into a little bit of trouble, and ultimately after college overdosed and did not die, came close to dying. His heart stopped, it was restarted. His opioid. body, opioid, oh, opioid. overdose, yeah. yes. Uh, did not die, but wasn't okay either. And I met him early on, really, after his overdose, so some five months after. And the question that I had to get to the question uh, that you had asked me earlier um, was about uncertainty. We don't know how well people can do after a brain injury, like the one that Ben had experienced, until maybe months to a year after the injury. And they were in this early period. And I was wondering, how did they navigate that? And so I spent some time with them and, and saw Ben as he relearned to do things like making a sandwich, like these, these tasks that used to be really easy for him, and tried to understand from Andrea what it was like to live with her son, who was her son but who was different. And ultimately learned that really all she could do was take it day by day. Her son had not died, but he was not the same. And she didn't know how good things were going to get but she knew that he was there and she tried to find things that made his life meaningful within the constraints of his reality. I find, you know, there was a, an earlier point in my life, I worked in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. and at, at the height of the Iraq war. And I, yeah. I can remember stories of, of, of soldiers coming back from Iraq with, with TBI and, yeah. and, and uh, awful injuries and uh, it, it, uh, it upending their families' lives yes. because the, the systems just weren't in place. The, the traditional response was, we'll institutionalize these people yeah. and you know get on with your life. And these families would say, no, this is my son. Yeah. And I'm thinking of one family in Northern Virginia that uh, moved their, 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 their mattress from their bed into their basement to sleep next to their oh son's God. hospital wow. bed wow. Uh, because they needed to clear a, something in his trach tube yeah. every night. Um, those kinds of stories about familial love yeah. and devotion to those those families is that's it, it, they're inspiring. Yeah, that's quite an image. Yeah. So I want to get back to Andrea and Ben. <clears throat> um, you hit on this. Their story and the story of many of the characters in the book is is a story of hope and love. Mm -hmm. Both, yeah. both hope and love. And in the case of Andrea, her her hopes diminished. I guess you could call it over a period of time as she as the months mm -hmm. passed and it was clear he was not going to be yeah. anything like the Ben before. Did she talk about that process of, of coming to accept that, of still holding some degree of hope? I mean, it, it, it was it, it's a long period of time. This, this isn't, you know, like watching a basketball game that you're going to know in two hours who wins or loses. Yeah. This could be, did she talk about that? She talked about it a little bit. I think I was almost more fixated on that particular question than, than her. And often when I ask what it was like to navigate this uncertainty and to, to, look, forward to, to look toward an uncertain future, uh, she would give me an answer that would have to do with her plans. She made plans. It wasn't clear what Ben looked like, but perhaps the next summer he could garden. It wasn't clear what he would be like in two years, but for now, uh, he was able to sleep in his own, in his bed on the first floor. And so I think that she was quite, uh, she's quite a, a smart and, and perceptive and introspective woman and was aware of how hard, how hard it was to hold that hope, but also to be a realistic. But she did it, I think, by, by making plans for the future, but plans that were reasonable, goals that were achievable. Did, so, did, uh, go ahead. No, last question. Ben mm -hmm. himself, yeah. did he have awareness of what had happened to him? That's actually one question. And the second question, another marvelous detail, which is representative of, of the writing in the book, he liked to make sandwiches. Mm -hmm. So talk about both of those things. Was he aware first? Yeah. When I sat with Andrea and Ben in their kitchen the first day that we met, I asked if Ben was aware. He was sitting right next to us as Andrea told his story, and he didn't seem to mind hearing about how he had almost died and how he had not. And she said that she felt that he was largely not aware of all that he had lost. There were little inklings that maybe he was. He was hesitant to go into a public space where his friends might be in a wheelchair, for instance. 
But ultimately, when you asked him, do you feel different? He said no. Was, what was he thinking? Uh, it's, hard, it's hard for us to tell. He um, found some joy, though, in making sandwiches. Yeah. Too. So Ben, before the accident, his mom told me, had been the sandwich man. So imagine he's like a big college kid and he would come back at two or three in the morning and be rummaging through the refrigerator and make some massive tower type of sandwich. And he just loved sandwiches and he could always make something delicious. He was a big eater with a big laugh. He, was, he filled a space. Um, and so the day that I saw them, Ben was learning how to make a sandwich. And he made the sandwich more quietly, as his mom pointed out. He was quite quiet. The sandwich was simple, uh, but he was able to put that together. And it seemed like maybe it was a skill that he had not forgotten, this pleasure of making a sandwich. Did, I'm wondering, so in writing this book, and, 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 and so you're a doctor, you're, you're interacting with patients all mm -hmm. the time. Um, but in writing this book, did this change you as a physician? I think so, and I think it's, it's hard, and it's something that I think about, because in writing this book, I gave myself so much leeway just to have all this time, to ask all of these questions, to probe, and you can't reasonably do that in a clinic appointment, in an ICU family meeting. But I think what you can do, or what I try to do, is take some of these lessons of what it might look like afterwards to remember people telling me how lost they felt after they left the hospital and how they wish they could have been given just an idea, a best case, a worst case, and a middle case of how things would turn out, and to try to start laying some of that out in the setting of the hospital. Since publication of the book, which we should note has gotten glowing reviews from USA Today and Library Journal and many other publications, have you heard from any of the people in the book? Oh yes, I have, I have spent more time than I ever hoped uh, with the people uh, in the book. So uh, those who are still around um, have come to my book readings. Uh, I just saw both Andrea, Ben, and uh, another person in the book, Charlie Atkinson, and his wife, Jeanette, came to an event I had just this past week. Uh, we've been in close touch. Are they grateful that you told these stories? They are. It makes me feel so honored. It's a, an extra plus that, that I hadn't expected. So one of the things, so you know, this is decidedly not a political book. Mm -hmm. uh, the show is broadcast on Sirius XM, so we, let me ask you a little question here. So 2018, 2017, 2018, the healthcare debate in this country uh, was front and center in, 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 yeah. in, 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 the, in the debates. Um, I'm curious, the, the, just the morale of people working in healthcare, someone who works in healthcare, how do those debates affect the way you do your jobs? Yeah. So in terms of the way we do our jobs in the intensive care unit, that does not shift. Uh, the way that we deliver care is, is really agnostic of people's uh, insurance, of, of anything that's kind of going on in their background, and that's both good and bad. Um, morale definitely shifts. I think that, that morale, morale declines in the setting of, of changes that that mean bad things for people's access to care. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the actual care we give in the intensive care unit, there's, 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 no, there's no shift. We're nearing the end of the show, and I wanted to close with one more patient, Cindy, Cindy rather, Scribner, mm -hmm. who was one of the lucky ones. She yes. has continued to lead, despite some debilitating uh, conditions, lead a, a fruitful life. Mm -hmm. Talk about her. Yes. So Cindy, I, I found, wanted to tell her story because she had undergone what I think is a fascinating technology, which is called ECMO, which stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. But what that is, is it's a machine that serves the purpose of the lung, draws blood out of the big vein in your neck, runs it through this device next to the bed, puts in oxygen, takes out carbon dioxide, shoots the blood back in. The reason that it's so interesting to me, different than dialysis or the partial heart that, that Van had, is that you can't leave the hospital with this. You can't even leave the intensive care unit. And so Cindy, it's a young mom, a nurse, who had gotten sick with a lung scarring disease called pulmonary fibrosis, and she was on a list for transplant, and she got so sick that she would have died had she not been put on this machine to allow her to wait until transplant. But there was no guarantee that a transplant was going to come, how long she was going to wait, whether she would suffer a bleed, a stroke before that. So they didn't know how things were going to turn out, and she was waiting in this limbo, living in the ICU with her body attached to this machine where she could watch her blood exit and enter. So I wanted to know what that was like. 
Cindy ultimately did well. She got the transplant. There were moments, times where it seemed like she might not, but she did. She survived, she made it home, and largely she has re-entered her life. But as this book paints, it's not entirely easy. People struggle with anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, and, and these are things Cindy will, will carry with her. And that doesn't mean she's not lucky or miraculous, but it's not fully simple. Is there another book in your, in your quiver? I, I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, there should be. Thank you. And when it, when it happens, we'll have you back. Well, It'll be we my hope pleasure. So too. It is a, it's a remarkable accomplishment. Congratulations. She's Daniela Lamas. The book is You Can Stop Humming Now. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Or you can always catch us on PellCenter.org, where you can catch up on previous episodes of the show. He's G. Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.